Uranium demand is rising as the demand for zero emissions baseline power grows. Rick Rule is one of the world's most successful uranium investors, and he's taken a stake in Homeland Uranium for good reason. Over five decades in the securities business, he founded the firm that became Sprott U.S. Holdings in 1990, and he has run dedicated uranium investor boot camps and has invested in a range of uranium exploration companies around the world. Is there a likelihood in the future sort of development that, as you see it, that the, these thorium reactors could displace uranium reactors because of all the features of thorium that make it more attractive? Right now, the principal... Uh, utility of thorium is to sell investment newsletters. Um, uh, what you say is true. The Chinese have made a bench scale thorium reactor work, which, by the way, is a spectacular technological adva advancement. Uh, and, and the U.S. has finally generated a, a fusion reactor that creates a small surplus in power as opposed to consuming power. Uh, rather than look at the news, however, what I prefer to do is look at the spending decisions of people who are using real money. The, the Chinese, as I understand it, have allocated uh, about $2 billion to thorium and $160 trillion, or pardon me, $160 billion to nuclear. Uh, while I welcome the technological advance, the investor in me looks at the commitment of funds to show statement of intent over the next 10 years. Uh, I hope as an energy consumer that the promise of fission, toggling back and forth between fission and fusion, would make uh, nuclear power effectively free. <laughs> Or thorium. I mean, I hope that's in our energy mix in the future. As an investor, James, I've learned that hope is not an investment strategy for me. So I follow the money. Uh, I follow the funded spending decisions. Uh, the world is building nuclear power plants like mad. <laughs> and um, following the money uh, tells me that one place I want to be is uranium. But the truth is, I want to be throughout the energy sector. Sure, sure. So then it's safe to say, conclude by your comments there, that the, the chilling effect of the Fukushima disaster that caused Germany to offline all of its nuclear reactors and Japan for a little bit has now sort of been tempered by the realities of energy demand. And uh, so we've sort of, you know, collectively said, well, it's uh, it's like they could they could make airplanes that where nobody gets hurt when they crash, but they'd be too expensive. And we uh, we have an acceptable level of risk mentality as a species where we say, you know, a lot more people can fly if we make the airplane where the odds of a crash are sufficiently low that everybody's willing to take that chance. And the same applies to the energy matrix. It's like, yes, there are costs associated with massive hydrocarbon dependencies ecologically, but we understand that they're, they're, the advance of technology will mitigate those to some extent. And there is there are natural processes that are bigger than all of us that will mitigate the costs of ecological degradation, shall we say, over time, and the move towards more efficient forms of power in the form of less emissions is inevitable. Great. So in the meantime, uranium is a good investment. And in that context, do you invest it in your, do you have inve uranium investments now? I do. Um, the upside in uranium was inevitable. I didn't expect, frankly, the political tide to turn so decidedly in favor of nuclear. It wasn't that long ago, five or six years ago, when people like me, uranium investors and speculators, were socially and politically vilified. Uh, now, these morons want to subsidize us. Uh, I have to say, I felt cleaner when I was vilified than now when I'm being subsidized. But the idea that the United States has progressed in five years from a period in time when Uranium speculators like me might find themselves an unflattering poster of themselves on a post office wall uh, to the point today where the morons in Congress want to subsidize us. Uh, that's incredible. The groundswell of popular support on a global basis. Uh, right after Fukushima, the Japanese public in polls uh, was 85 percent opposed to nuclear power. In the most recent poll that I read, the Japanese public was 75 percent in favor of nuclear power. The Japanese government, which uh, shut down 40 plants, 42, has re has committed to reopening 42 and has reopened 14. Uh, this is a tremendous change in support. The co-founder of Greenpeace uh, came out and said that the only chance that the world has to escape the uh, e ecological impact of increasing populations and increasing carbon generation is nuclear. <laughs> uh, 
to be on the side of Greenpeace is certainly a first in my career, and, and frankly, not unwelcome. Um, you know, one can only be a pariah for so long. Uh, you mentioned Germany, too, and I think that's instructive. Uh, the Germans decided that they would cast their energy future on solar, which is odd for a northern country where the sun doesn't shine. Uh, the consequence of that is that they shut down non-carbon generating fuel, nuclear. And as a consequence of that, they had to greatly increase their coal consumption. Uh, in the meantime, uh, German electricity is now five times more expensive and much less reliable. I think what's what you're seeing is that uh, necessity is beginning to impose itself on narrative. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I, I think that uh, societies and consumers and investors need to make fact-based decisions, uh, that we need to avoid the Bidens and the Merkels and the Thornburgs and the Trudeaus and, frankly, the Trumps uh, in making our investment decisions. We need to back away from the narrative and think more about the engineers. And, and I think that'll make for a much more secure and prosperous and, frankly, clean future. You know, one of the things that's always struck me about the, the carbon narrative First of all, I'm not saying it's not true. I don't know, but that's a different question. What you've seen is that the carbon narrative has been an excuse for the political class uh, to impose themselves on us. There is no country in the world that I know of that's implemented a carbon tax that was revenue neutral. In other words, it was never about carbon. It was always about money. Uh, if they imposed a carbon tax where the proceeds from that tax reduced other taxes, then the carbon tax would be about carbon. It's not. It's about using carbon as an excuse to steal more of your money to fund their interests. <laughs> uh, whether or not you agree with their use of the money, it's pretty obvious that the carbon tax was never meant to be revenue neutral. It isn't about carbon. It's about money. Right. Yeah. Never mind the whole ridiculousness of the argument that I'm fat. I'm going to pay you to diet. Then I'll be skinny. <laughs> that to me has always been very <laughs> suspicious. OK, so uh, just to put a bow on that discussion, do you have any uh, uranium investments that you need to disclose? Well, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm invested across the space. Um uh, in, in the small in the small sector, we talked before we went on the air about homeland uranium, who are people you know. Uh, yes, I'm a shareholder there. I'm a shareholder. I'm a very large shareholder in Cameco. Uh, I'm a I'm a shareholder in twelve fairly small uranium companies. Uh, I, I should note that the investment landscape worldwide is littered with about 120 of these things. Uh, I suspect that a hundred of the 120 are valueless at any uranium price. <laughs> so it's important that if you believe in the uranium thesis, that you spend enough time educating yourself so that in movie parlance, you can segregate between the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, in the uranium space. If you buy the sector, you can and will go broke. That's what will happen. Uh, if you focus your investments on companies that you think have a durable competitive advantage, at least relative to their price, a speculative advantage, I think you'll do quite well in the uranium space over the next five years. As long as you pick the right 12 out of 120. Yeah, there has to be a reason. You know, we t we, we talked about Homestake, uh, uh, par pardon me, Homeland. And I don't want to belabor Homeland. This is not investment advice. This is not a tout. Uh, Homeland uh, is a company that's focused on U.S. uranium. The U.S. will never be the lowest cost producer in uranium, but it may very well be with the increase in demand for uranium and the new permitting regime uh, and, uh, unfortunately, frankly, uh, subsidies for uranium, that the cost of capital for U.S. uranium development will be lower than any other place in the world. A strategy around that, a strategy where high-quality uranium people aggregate uranium projects that made no sense at $30 uranium, but might make spectacular success at $80 or $100 uranium, is one of the reasons why, as a speculator, I gravitated to 12 uranium juniors, including Homeland. Once again, not a stock recommendation, disclosure of conflict, but much more importantly, if somebody hears us say all these wonderful things about uranium, James, they might be tempted to speculate in uranium juniors that have no hope of success at any uranium price. Right. 
Right. That's uh, the persistent threat of junior market investing is if you don't have a reliable source of knowledge or experience, it's going to be very hard to hit the winners and avoid the losers. Right now, the principal utility of thorium is to sell investment newsletters. Communities that have low energy consumption per capita are poor. We're going to need more of all kinds of power. Many people will divorce themselves from arithmetic and go to narrative. Uh, your former premier said there wasn't a business case for natural gas in Canada. Hope is not an investment strategy. The investor in me looks at the commitment of funds. Markets work. 